Welcome back to the channel, hope everybody's doing well. And in today's video we're continuing with the UT505B. In my last video I did a full review on this and I found some issues with both continuity function and the installation resistance testing function. Uh, so I'm going to take a closer look at the continuity function. At the moment we're set to the continuity function on the UT505B and we're actually in open circuit and I've got the U1828A running here as a voltmeter just straight across the output and I've also got an oscilloscope uh, just over there in the form of a picoscope uh, data being collected by the laptop so that we can uh, see what the output trace is like uh, so we are set to single shot on the oscilloscope so we'll just do a single capture uh, you can hit the go button and you can see we are 4.99 volts on the key site there. Uh, nominal open circuit voltage is 5 volts for the UT505B so that matches quite nicely and you can see we've captured a trace on the oscilloscope that we had to save and we'll look at it in uh, more detail but it looks like there is an overshoot initially um, and an undershoot as well and then it settles down. Um, it seems to be fairly good in that respect. doesn't seem to be too much interference on it. Okay, so I'll just run this test again so you can see the capture on the scope. Uh, we'll just hit the go button. Um, there you can see the scope has gone in there. And again, 4.99 volts is running on the output. So that's all good. Okay, so that's that done. What we'll just do is reconfigure this so we can measure the short circuit current so we can get an idea of what's going on with that as well. Okay, so I'm just going to power this through. Uh, the 2.2 ohm load resistor that we used the last time and uh, see what current we get going through this. We're obviously looking at uh, 200 milliamp there. It feels like it, 199.43 milliamp, so that's pretty good, isn't it? The, I know it's said 2.2 ohm, but this has got its own internal uh, resistance for the shunt, that's why the reading isn't quite right on the instrument but current wise we're getting 199.44 so that's all good okay so another little reconfiguration required so I've just pan round a little bit more we are now set up uh, back on a voltmeter on the U12828A still on continuity and this time we've put our DARPI simulator uh, that I had trouble measuring the continuity on the last time uh, this actually gave me zero ohms uh, quite uh, unusually uh, this oscilloscope we've just put that on to auto because I want to capture a longer measurement with this now um, so we'll just hit the go button again so as you can see we've got zero ohms again which is what was happening before uh, we've got um, the multimeter pulsing as well and if we look at the actual scope so we can go in there and you can see on the oscilloscope now uh, we've got a very spiky output and I presume this is why it's giving me the zero ohms here it just doesn't like it at all does it uh, we'll just swap over onto a winding simulator because when it was on this it didn't like this at all and just uh, shut off straight away so I'll just set this to single shot on this and we'll see what happens um, yeah crikey that's quite a mess on the oscilloscope over there I'll put the picture up again of the oscilloscope you can see we've gone to fuse fail again on this. Um, it really doesn't like what's going on with that at all. Okay, so we've just reset everything so we're back running with our oscilloscope connected back up. We've gone back to our Pi simulator and in the background here we've got a capacitance box as well. Um, so we can put the screen up for the oscilloscope and show that he's running. We'll switch him on. Again, you can see the oscillation there that's going on in there. We'll connect up our capacitance box and we'll just see if we can filter out some of this. Uh, let's go 10 mark farads for starters and you can see in actual fact okay so we've got 0.16 ohms on here and we are a straight line on our scope no problems. Um, so this should be, you should be at 0.4 on this, so perhaps a little bit high, but we haven't zeroed anything yet either. Uh, and we are running on connections, aren't we? So let's just, uh, let's go to a 10, 
in 10 nanofarads. So you can still see we've got oscillation on the scope there, 10 nanofarads. Let's go 20. And you see with every increase in capacitance, we're getting the smoother and smoother line. We're not affecting the reading any. Um, that's 0.9 there, so then I'll go back. Um, it's 100 nanofarad there. Okay, so 200 nanofarad is when it's switched over. So that's when the oscillation stopped. Um, so what's the standard size capacitor on there? It'd be 220, I guess, wouldn't it? Um, so yeah, there you have it. That seems to have cured the oscillations on this uh, on a 220 nanofarad. So what I'll just do is take them off of there. Uh, we had uh, and go back to our winding simulator and just see if that's got anything. So this should be 1.2 ohms, um, somewhere around about there, on 1.32. So again, we're pretty good with that aspect as well. We've got a steady voltage coming out on the voltmeter. Um, so that appears to be getting rid of a lot of the oscillation. Okay, so what I'm going to do is knock all this down and bring the three-phase motor back in that we also struggled to measure the winding resistance on when we were on continuity function and see if that solves that one as well. Okay, so we have reset everything and we've now set up the continuity tester to operate on to the little three-phase motor I've got. We've connected across two of the windings inside this motor with our continuity function. I'm actually reading we're on at the moment and we've got greater than 100 ohms. You can see the voltmeter here is still pulsing away as before and if I pan around to the scope there you can see that that's showing the pulse up on the waveform as well. I'm going to uh, take out the voltmeter out of the equation and just put in our little capacitance box and then we'll see how we get on with that there. Okay so you can see we've got our capacitance box set up now. Uh, we are still showing over 100 ohms because I've not switched any capacitance on. The previous value is 220 nanofarads, so we'll go up in uh, 100 nanofarads, and you can see I've actually pulled back 26.2 ohms, which this is about 25 to 26 ohms on the actual winding resistance on the motor there, so that's a valid reading uh, at 100 nanofarads. We'll just pin back to the uh, scope there you can see we've still got a little bit of uh, oscillation on the output there haven't we so uh, let's take this all up to 200 nanofarads and uh, we'll put 220 nanofarads onto it so that's what we were there beforehand we've still got the oscillation of types uh, we're still running 26.3 so that's not affected at anything uh, let's just try some more capacitance so uh, we'll turn off the nanofarads and let's go to uh, one microfarad and you can see there the one microfarad has uh, taken it away completely hasn't it that's a fairly good straight line now so that's 2.2 .2 microfarads not much better there really is it so we could probably stick with one microfarad uh, turn everything off let's go to uh, 220 before 70 wouldn't it um, so in actual fact, 470, uh, still a little bit. Uh, let's go 560 is the next one. Still a little bit of oscillation. Uh, 680 there. Yeah, we're not doing uh, much, aren't we? We need to be in our microfarads by the looks of things for, for this one. Yeah, okay then. So that looks to be fairly reasonable at around about one microfarad uh, and I've removed my oscillation and I've got my good winding resistance measurement there just flicking my over to the other winding uh, 26.2 and then the third winding 26.1 so that's a good set of readings there and it looks to be performing reasonably well okay so that's fine what I'm just going to do is knock this all out of the way and set up a resistance box 
and do some resistance measurements just to make sure that the additional capacitance isn't affecting the accuracy of the instrument. So I'll just show you what I did to test out the continuity function to make sure that the additional capacitance hasn't affected the accuracy of it. Um, I've set the instrument up here for this particular one. We are on a uh, 0 to 100 ohm resistance box. You can see I've zeroed it up with it all set to zero. So I've taken out any residual resistance for the test circuit. Uh, and then I can select this to different values. So for the 200 milliamp range, it's zero to 10 ohms. So I did four values. Um, I think I did uh, a one, 2.5, 5.5 and 9.5 spread across the actual range of the instrument there. So we'll just show you uh, the 5.5. So we've set it up to 5.5, hit my test button. And you can see I've got a reading there, that's 5.46, which is within tolerance. That just knock him off. Uh, what I then did then was add in the capacitance into the instrument. Uh, so we've set this up for 220. So I'll just show you that here, we've set this up for 220 nanofarads to start with, left it on the 5.5 ohms, hit the test button again. And you can see with 5.44, a little bit of drift, but nothing too much to worry about. I'll just knock him off, and then we set him back to zero, and then went to my one microfarad there and tested again. And you see, got another reading there, uh, and recorded all of that. Uh, and then for the 20 milliamp function, uh, I had to move to 11 ohms on this because 10 ohms. The meter stays on 200 milliamps, so I can just uh, see if it does it on this box on 10 milliamps. You see I've actually stayed on the 200 milliamp test current there, so in order to uh, get into the 20 milliamp, I went to 11 ohms, and there you see you've got 20 milliamp there, and then just went through exactly the same, uh, just with multiple factor of 10 onto the test points, uh, just to make sure that the continuity function was still accurate. And just put up this results table here, and you see the 200 milliamp tests are in the top four, and then the 20 milliamp tests are in the bottom four sets of readings. And you can see the expected value that I'm putting in there in the first column, and then the next column there, that's the reading I took without any capacitance putting power to the resistance. And then the column with the 220 nanofarad capacitance in parallel, and then the one microfarad in parallel. Then at the very end there on that table, you can see the expected minimum and maximum values. And as I said, all those test figures do fall within the range of those tolerances. So that's quite a good result for me there, really. I can easily add in some extra capacitance to solve this issue that I have with the continuity function. I'm not always measuring correctly. Um, now there's a couple of ways I could do that before I open up the instrument. I think I'll actually have to do quite a bit more testing on some larger motors to see if it still is an issue on larger motors or if it resolves it itself or if I do have to put in a, a larger capacitor to solve the problem with them. Um, in the meantime, what you could do, these jacks here are standard 19mm spacing, so you can get these little 19mm adapters here and you can put them in and then I could put a lead on this coming out with the capacitor put in parallel across there, fits nicely into the little cutout in there and then use that as a just a cable adapter to solve my current issue which is one way of doing it. Uh, the downside to that of course is that once I've got that in there I won't be able to use my uh, control probe. Uh, it just won't fit in there obviously so that will be the downside to that. It's not too much of an issue for me because I don't tend to use this a lot for motors so I'm not too concerned with that one. So that's kind of the resolution I've come to for the continuity function. We do still have the issue with the insulation test function that I had on the motor with this reading almost twice the reading of the other instrument I used when I was testing. So I'm going to have to have a look into that. That's a little bit more difficult to look into because of the voltages that are involved and how you capture the data without affecting the actual insulation test itself. Um, but I'll put that into another video. Um, that'll be it for this video. Thanks very much for watching. I uh, hope you found it useful and I will see you again in the next one.